Now recall that I talked about how money supply is determined both by banks and the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is our central bank. In the example that follows, I'm going to demonstrate how bank lending increases the money supply. Suppose you walk into bank one and deposit $1,000 in your checking account. The money supply doesn't immediately change because currency held by the public and the checking accounts are both part of the money supply. However, um, the Federal Reserve might have set the reserve requirement ratio at 10%. So bank one has to hold $100 by law in its vault. It can't lend out $100, but it can lend out the rest of it. Well, what's 1,000 minus 100? 900. What does bank one do with the 900? Well, it could lend out all $900. And suppose it does this to a guy named George. Now, suppose George uses the $900 to buy a TV from Bymart. <clears throat> Bymart then deposits the $900 into its account at Bank 2. Now, again, money supply doesn't change at this point because currency held by the public and the checking accounts are both part of the money supply. Now, since the reserve requirement ratio was set at 10%, Bank 2 can't lend out $90 of that $900 deposit. What's left? 810. So maybe it lends $810 to Jill, who buys a TV for $810 from Bymart. Bymart then deposits $810 into its account. And then um, of that $810, by lot has to hold $81 um, in reserves. But then can then has seven twenty nine dollars to lend out. Suppose the bank lends seven twenty nine dollars to Henrietta, who buys a TV from Bymart for seven twenty nine dollars. Well, Bymart is going to drop seven twenty nine dollars into its checking account at Bank Two, and the process keeps going on infinitum, which means there are infinite many numbers being summed up on the left hand side. Well, it just so happens mathematically, this sum, in mathematics we say, converges to $10,000. Well, the, the numbers on the left-hand side um, can, can be rewritten as the initial increase in checkable, checkable deposits divided by the reserve requirement ratio. Now, the original deposit was $1,000, the reserve requirement ratio is 10% or 0.1. 1,000 divided by 0.1 is $10,000. Hence, increases in bank deposits creates money in the economy via increased bank lending, even though the actual number of bills in the economy has not changed. Now, the same is true in reverse. Withdrawing money from a bank and putting it in your mattress destroys money. And the way this works is, suppose you walk into the bank, withdraw $1,000 from your checking account at Bank 1. When the money supply doesn't change immediately because currency held by the public and in checking accounts are both part of the money supply. However, since the reserve requirement ratio is 10%, Bank 1 now holds $100 less than required reserves and lends out $900 less. Bank One cannot lend George the $900 he needs to buy his TV. George does not spend the $900 at Bymart. Bymart deposits $900 less in its account at Bank Two. Since the reserve requirement ratio is 10%, Bank Two holds $90 less in required reserves and does not lend out the $110 to Jill. Yada, yada, yada. Hence, the original withdrawal of 1000 destroys money via less lending. So here, the, the, uh, the, the change in checkable deposits was minus 1000. Minus 1000 divided by the reserve requirement ratio of 10% or 0.1 is minus 10,000. So withdrawals collapse the money in economy via less bank lending, even though the actual number of bills in the economy has not changed. Okay.
Now we're going to go to um, the process by which the Fed uses to control the money supply. And we call the tools that it has at its disposal monetary policy tools. Now before we do that, we need to define some things. In blue, we have quantity demanded for excess reserves. Now this is, this is uh, denoted Q superscript D subscript ER, the quantity demanded for excess reserves. Now, you can think of these excess reserves as insurance against big withdrawals. Um, that's the way I think about it. Um, if, I don't know if you've ever watched the Beverly Hillbillies, but the funny thing about the Beverly Hillbillies, what made it so funny is that the Clampets did not understand how bank lending worked. They didn't understand when they put money into the bank of Beverly Hills, the Commerce Bank of Beverly Hills, that Milburn Drysdale, the president, was going to take a portion of that money, 99% uh, if the money's in savings accounts, or 90% of it's in checking accounts, and lend that out. So the Beverly Hillbillies, Jed and Granny and Jethro and, and uh, Jed's daughter, Ellie Mae, actually thought, their characters actually thought, that the money was sitting big in the vault. And if they wanted to go back to Bug Tussle, Arkansas, they could drive to the bank, put the money on the truck, and drive back with no problem. However, all their money was being lent out. And Drives was lending the money out because he was paying the, the clampets to store it there, but then he has to make a profit, so he lends it out at a higher interest rate. And that difference in those interest rates represent his profit. So um, if, if uh, banks are fearful that Jed Clampett types might pull money out of uh, their checking accounts and out of their savings accounts, then they might want to have a lot of excess reserves on hand so they can handle the demand for the money. So that's why I think of excess reserves as big withdrawal insurance. The more excess reserves you have, the more you can handle um, these bank runs or these, these large withdrawals. Now the federal funds rate is the cost of big withdrawal insurance, and that's how I think about it. I had to note the federal funds rate as IFF. The cost of excess reserves is the opportunity cost of not making loans. So if the way the banks work is that um, if a bank has lots of excess reserves on its books at the end of the night, another bank might have trouble meeting its reserve requirement. So that bank might call up your bank and say, hey, can you, can you, I know that you have some excess reserves. Can I borrow some of them from you? And you go, yeah, but I want to make a little money off it, and you charge them this federal funds rate. Okay. Now, if you decide not to lend to that bank, you're foregoing the opportunity of earning interest on your excess reserves. So the federal funds rate represents the cost, the opportunity cost of not making loans to other banks that, have, that are having a hard time meeting the reserve requirement. Now, if the federal funds rate falls, the cost of excess reserves falls. In other words, the premium uh, falls. Thus, banks are more willing to purchase big withdrawal insurance. In other words, the, the, the smaller the interest rate, the less opportunity cost of not making loans to banks that are struggling to meet the reserve requirement, the more excess reserves a bank is going to hold holding all else constant. So the federal funds rate falls. When it, when it falls, the quantity demanded for excess reserves rises. Now, this suggests there's a demand curve for excess reserves. And I'm going to call the demand for curve for excess reserves, I'm going to define it as the following equation, where R, superscript WCS, subscript E is the worst case scenario, WCS, the worst case scenario level of excess reserves banks will hold. Okay, so it's a worst case scenario. 
and then we're just subtracting off the federal funds rate from that. So it's a simple demand curve. Now the quantity of reserves, which we called R, subscript R, is determined by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve requires banks to hold, to not lend out, a percentage of total of the total amount of deposits in their vaults. D. D is the total amount of deposits in bank vaults. Now the percentage required is called the reserve requ the required reserve ratio, which we denote as Rho, the weird looking P letter. Thus the quantity of reserves required is defined by this equation, the funny looking P or Rho times capital D. So the quantity demanded for reserves is the sum of required reserves and excess reserves. So the quantity demanded for reserves is equal to required reserves plus the quantity demanded for excess reserves. Um, the demand for reserves is the equation where we replace quantity demanded for excess reserves with its equation. Now I'm multiplying by one here because I just want to illustrate that that one is going to be the slope. So all I did here is I solved for the federal funds rate. I solved for this, right? I added IFF to both sides and I subtracted the slope times the quantity demanded for reserves, this being beta. Okay. So if the, if the slope, if we denote the slope as beta, we define that to be equal to 1, then this is mathematically equivalent to that. Now this looks like Egyptian hieroglyphics, so let's, let's do a numerical example. Suppose the reserve requirement ratio is 0.1, and checkable deposits total 50 billion. And then banks in total want to hold 25 billion as for worst case scenario, just in case something goes bad, banks want, as worst case scenario, $25 billion in excess reserves. And the slope of the uh, demand for excess reserves is equal to 1. We're going to graph the demand for reserves below. Okay. So we've replaced the weird looking P or rho with 0.1 we replace D with 50, which in units is $50 billion. We've replaced the R superscript WCS subscript E, the worst case scenario excess reserves with 25, and then the slope was 1, so we have minus QDR, the quantity demanded for reserves. Simplification yields the equation federal funds rate equals 30 minus the quantity demanded for reserves. And re remember, the coefficient of quantity demanded for reserves is 1. So let's go ahead and graph the demand for reserves. Now if the federal funds rate is 2%, then the quantity demanded for reserves must have been 28. So if I put if I plug 2 into here, and I solve that for the quantity demanded for reserves, I get 30 minus 2, which is 28. Okay, So if the quantity demanded for reserves is 28, 30 minus 28 is 2. So the federal funds rate would be 2 in that case. And I plot that over here. So the quantity demanded for reserves is 28 when the federal funds rate is 2. Now, when the federal funds rate is 5, I replace that with 5, solve that at 25, I go up until I hit 5, and then go to left. And then the demand for reserves is a downward sloping line.